when the Fed printed a bunch of money during COVID and gave it to like BlackRock to manage, like was that incompetence? Especially when BlackRock like wrote a plan at the end of 2019 of the monetary policy that the Fed followed exactly when COVID happened about what the Fed would need to do during a unforeseen crisis. I mean, it's just like, was that incompetence or is that corruption? You know? And so, I mean, a lot of times they'd try and absolve themselves of like, obvi- when they sort of get caught or start to get caught for something corrupt, they'll be like, oh, don't look any further. We're just really stupid. If you consider just like the massive amount of wealth transfer that's happened in the past 20 years to like the people at the very top, um, obviously, well, I, I think it's obvious, but I mean, that can't all have been because of incompetence. Esteemed journalist Whitney Webb has garnered recognition not only for her profound and incisive analysis of numerous societal issues, but also for her courageous stance in consistently exposing the deceit propagated by the global elite. In a recent interview with Peter McCormick on the What Bitcoin Did channel, Whitney delves into a disturbing revelation regarding a massive conspiracy aimed at regulating the internet and abolishing privacy and anonymity indefinitely. According to Whitney, the nefarious agenda seeks to subjugate the entire global populace, eradicating independent thought and rendering individuals wholly reliant on the ruling class. This manipulation is designed to ensure compliance with their dictates while offering mere trinkets in return. Whitney further asserts that politicians and regulators are vehemently opposing Bitcoin and the broader cryptocurrency sector because it poses a significant threat to their machinations. During her conversation with Peter, Whitney unveils detailed plans to entrust artificial intelligence with control over the internet. AI would not only oversee censorship but also dominate content creation, thereby shaping the informational landscape and influencing human thought. Citing insights from Eric Schmidt, former CEO of Google, Whitney underscores the alarming prospect of AI dictating our perception of reality by controlling online content entirely. Before we continue with the rest of the video, do check out daily 5-minute crypto newsletter with all the latest crypto and Bitcoin news. It's a fantastic analysis of on-chain crypto data and breakdowns, and the best part is it's absolutely free. They'll cover expert predictions, breakdowns of on-chain crypto data, and any breaking news you need to know, all in a nutshell. Click the first link in the description and enter your email to join over 50,000 others in becoming a better crypto investor right now. Please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and don't forget to drop your comment and observations in the comment section below. Thanks and enjoy the video. There's been a push for several years, but now it's gaining an insane amount of momentum and, and steam. Uh, but it really goes back several years. Uh, and the, the goal is to have a regulated internet, which means the end of online privacy and anonymity. Um, and they want to do this, uh, by having people link a government issued ID to their internet access and internet activity. Who is that? So in the U S, um, well, the, well, like it's come from the government, but it's not a lot of government policy, whether it's about this or something else doesn't come organically from the government. It comes from think tanks. It comes from, uh, you know, groups like that, or even the WEF, the world economic forum, yeah. um, that are then given to politicians and politicians legislate and enact it. And then the state enforces it, but it's not necessarily the ideas of the legislature and the state itself, these policies. Uh, and more often than not, these think tanks are funded by corporations and billionaires and all of these guys, and they also own the politicians. So it's really them creating the policy and they use the state as an enforcer to force it on the public. Right. So that's, I guess, the global public private partnership is what um, my colleague Ian Davis calls them, they, right? And I think it's uh, pretty fair. Um, he puts the BIS at the top, by the way, <laughs> of the pyramid. Ah. Uh, yeah, but yeah. this policy, uh, one of the earliest iterations of it, at least in the United States, uh, was during the Obama administration. They called it a driver's license for the internet. The idea of in order to access the internet, when you set up, you know, internet connection at your house, the internet service provider links all of your internet traffic to your ID. And in doing so, the government and the signals intelligence arm or intelligence agency of the government then has access uh, to not just everything you're posting and writing online, but also everything you read and consume online. And everything you buy. And everything you buy. Totally. I mean, uh, this whole push is completely related to ending financial anonymity and financial privacy as well. It's a completely interrelated thing. Um, And I've done uh, pretty extensive deep dives on this uh, going back to probably like 2021 because it's very tied up with how they're likely to force this regulated internet on the populace because they're not just going to be like, 
let's do this now. I mean, people aren't going to go along with it. So they need some sort of um, event that gets people uh, angry and afraid and panicking in order to stick it through. So basically, uh, this is going to be folded into, I guess, what I would call a Cyber Patriot Act. The Patriot Act being the legislation pushed through in the U.S. after September 11th, 2001. Right. Um, a lot of which wasn't necessarily related to anything to do with 9-11, but was a huge power grab by the state taking advantage opportunistically of the panic after 9-11. So they need some sort of event like that to ram all this stuff through. But the, the plans have been on the books for a very long time, and it's not just the U.S., it's really everywhere. I mean, um, I think in uh, the U.K. you have something called like the online safety bill. They have all these different excuses, exactly. a lot of it, like the online safety bill. Uh, they'll say, oh, it's about protecting children. But really, it's about ending encryption, which law enforcement in the UK and the US have been trying to do so hard for years and years and years. I mean, Bill Barr, uh, uh, who was attorney general under Trump in the US, was like, mm. that was his main policy goal was to end encryption. And he talked about it all the time, but a lot of people didn't really pay attention, I guess. But in the UK, it's a similar push because, of course, as I'm sure you're aware, um, the UK national security state and the US national security state are very intertwined, uh, specifically signals intelligence, the whole Five Eyes Alliance, which is obviously includes more countries, but it's it's UK and US dominated, obviously. It's not like mm -hmm. Australia and New Zealand are running the show. That During the interview, Whitney explains that while the regulation itself is utterly abhorrent, the manner in which it is being enforced is even more sinister. According to the renowned journalist and writer, authorities cloak their plans under the guise of protecting underage users or combating cybercrimes. However, their true agenda involves introducing more instruments of control until the entire system is completely under their dominion. Whitney also highlights another crucial aspect that many overlook, as they strive to seize complete control of the internet. They simultaneously push for people to conduct more aspects of their lives online. Nearly every facet of the physical world is gradually being supplanted by its digital counterpart, from work and education to investing in everyday tasks like grocery shopping. This concerted effort aims to facilitate mass surveillance and control over the populace. Returning to Whitney's interview, it becomes increasingly apparent that the forces at play are not merely seeking regulation for the public good but are orchestrating a comprehensive strategy to extend their influence and dominance over both the virtual and physical realms. So in terms of what we're talking about with government, you know, regulation of the internet and, and all of this, it's coming, right? We're already seeing the first signs of it here. Uh, there's an obvious push to censor more speech and link people's uh, speech to their ID and have it more surveillable than ever before. Uh, gutting encryption, uh, what's the, why do they want to do that? So they can read everything that you say and all your transactions, follow them all. There's a similar effort in crypto and specifically with Bitcoin uh, to criminalize mixers and criminalize any sort of service that affords you uh, increased financial privacy. So a big complaint about Binance from the DOJ is that they were allowing people uh, that were subject subjected to U.S. sanctions to use their service, but they're not really like a U.S. company, are they? But the U.S. government I mean, the U.S. is an empire. They want to be able to go to any country and say, you can't do that. We're actually in charge. You know what I mean? So Binance not being under their thumb and being active in all these other countries, allowing people in, in Iran to use their services, for example. I mean, that was a big sticking point for them. It wasn't like criminals, terrorists in Iran. It was just like people in Iran. They're subject to U.S. sanctions. You're not uh, complying with U.S. sanctions. And so we're going to charge you a billion dollars and take out your chief executive and uh, put our people in charge. You know, it's my, this is the mafia guys. I wrote a, I wrote a thousand page book about how the government is in the U.S. is organized crime, specifically the Department of Justice. And uh, that's what they're doing. And keep in mind, too, uh, the DOJ has an insane amount of Bitcoin it holds and they want more. Well, you know, I definitely think Bitcoin has the potential to be a tool for financial freedom, but I think it's definitely there's major efforts well underway to co-opt that to serve the same agenda. Right. And so I think um, people in the Bitcoin space that want it to be a tool for financial freedom need to get wise to those efforts to co-opt and resist because it's either a tool of financial freedom or it's not. You know what I mean? And so, yeah, if you cede enough territory and let them like completely dollarize Bitcoin and turn it into like a tool of U.S. empire um, to keep the dollar afloat and like, you know, keep dollar hege hegemony going forever and ever and ever. Um, and, you know 
are saying it's a flaw in Bitcoin that you like uh, can't put dollars easily on Bitcoin and all of this. I mean, no. I mean, the whole point supposedly, right, of creating Bitcoin was to give uh, Wall Street banks the middle finger and create something that uh, had immutable sound monetary policy. Correct? So if you allow them to co-opt it so it's not those things anymore, what are you left with? The same old world. Is it a tool of financial freedom or is it just, uh, has it the promise of Bitcoin been hollowed out and uh, replaced with uh, Wall Street garbage? Is, is that what you think the issue there, like ETFs, are you alluding to the ETFs? There's all, there's all sorts of things right. that are happening in, in Bitcoin right now that could be under that umbrella. Uh, but when you start to have people like BlackRock being like, you know what, we actually like Bitcoin now, that's a sign to pay attention. So I think people need to, uh, in the Bitcoin space, need to be very aware that there is a, is a fight being had right now about the future of Bitcoin. And you have to decide which side you're on. Are you going to fight for Bitcoin to be a tool of financial freedom or are you going to allow it to be co-opted uh, by the powers that be that it was supposedly designed to resist them and, you know, uh, be something they can't control. Are you going to give them control of it? I mean, th the answer should be no to any Bitcoiner worth respecting, in my opinion. Whitney's warnings regarding the extensive conspiracy against Bitcoin are not novel. In a Bitcoin Magazine article from the previous year, the journalist unveiled a significant nexus between the Department of Justice, anti-crypto senators such as Elizabeth Warren, and escalating narratives linking Bitcoin to notorious terrorist groups. According to the article, numerous entities purportedly combating cybercrime in the U.S., including the DOJ and FBI, form part of an international public-private partnership housed within the World Economic Forum, the infamous You Will Own Nothing and Be Happy organization. Further revelations by Whitney indicate that this group, far from being focused on combating cybercrime, is singularly fixated on exerting control over every facet of our lives. In her article, Whitney disclosed that this public-private partnership, known as the WEF Partnership Against Cybercrime or WFPC, is overseen by a former intelligence agent named T. Goldstein, whose military intelligence career in Israel was marked by efforts to integrate intelligence agencies with private technology companies. Moreover, Whitney disclosed that the FBI, DOJ, and intelligence agencies of Israel and Britain, along with major financial institutions like Bank of America and tech giants such as Amazon and Microsoft, are participants in this partnership. The objective appears to extend beyond combating cybercrime, indicating a much more sinister agenda. What are your thoughts on Whitney's interview? Feel free to share your comments and observations in the comments section below. For more Daily Dose Crypto News, check out these two awesome videos on your screen. Click now and we will see you on the next video.